Uh, that's a great uh, text to have as a first sermon is to preach in a congregation where we get to hear Jesus' words of his mission. Um, in another congregation, my first sermon, I received these words from Jesus to preach on. I have come to bring fire. Do you think I came to bring peace? No, but division. Families will be divided. So, <laughs> I'm glad I get Luke chapter 4. <laughs> in our reading from Luke today, Jesus reveals his mission and his identity. And this reading follows soon after Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan. We learn that Jesus' ministry is spirit-led. In Luke chapter 3, we hear, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. Then the Holy Spirit fills and leads Jesus into the wilderness for a time of testing. We hear in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now as Jesus returns to Galilee, the Holy Spirit will fill him with power for ministry as he reads a text that will be his mission statement as Messiah. Luke chapter 4, we hear, Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He went to church, right? He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed. <coughs> and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. These are the very first words that Jesus speaks in the entire Gospel of Luke. He reads from the Holy Scriptures. And he says, Today. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus' ministry is spirit-led. And we learn that Jesus fulfills scripture. The words he reads, reads come from Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 58. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And from Isaiah 58, to let the oppressed go free. Jesus is the one that the prophets spoke of, the Christ, the Messiah, the one who will bring redemption and healing. The one who will bring the long awaited good news of hope to the poor, the oppressed, and the imprisoned. The one who will bring release for those in literal captivity and those captive to sin and in need of forgiveness. Jesus is the one who was hoped for. Jesus is sent to the poor, the captives, the blind, and the oppressed. There is great reality of brokenness today as well. There are many in need of freedom. There are many in our prisons. There are many who are poor and who are hungry. There's a few statistics here on human trafficking, some of those who are oppressed and captives today. There are approximately 20 to 30 million slaves in the world today. According to the U.S. State Department, 600,000 to 800,000 people are trafficked across international borders every year, and 80% of those are female and half are children. There are 14,000 to 17,000 people trafficked into the United States every year. And there are many who are poor and in need today. We hear hunger statistics. 795 million people in the world do not have enough food. That's about one in nine people. Poor nutrition causes nearly half of deaths in children under five, 3.1 million children each year. There are many in need of freedom, a life, and the good news of Jesus. And Jesus brings hope and healing and freedom and forgiveness. In our gospel reading today, the initial response to Jesus' reading in the synagogue is positive. These words do sound nice. Especially if they're talking about us, or our family, or our town. But when Jesus begins to let them know the true power behind these words of grace, 
and healing and good news for outsiders and for others, for those beyond our community, not necessarily those that we were even there present to hear Jesus' message, people of other nations, the poor, who we might think deserve it, or maybe the prisoners that we might think should stay captive. We begin, we begin to fear and become angry about these gracious words. Who is this Jesus? In the verses following in Luke, which Pastor Dennis will preach on next Sunday, we learn that the people begin to get so angry that they attempt to kill Jesus. They took their eyes off of Jesus and rested their eyes on their own hopes for themselves. They couldn't accept the good news for Jesus. They couldn't accept the good news that Jesus was called to bring for others. And so they refused the good news for themselves. But this does not have to be the way it is. We can hear this as good news for others and for ourselves when we recognize the brokenness in ourselves. David Lowe writes, God comes not for the perfect, but the imperfect. Not for the healthy, but the ill. Not for the righteous, but the unrighteous. Not for the strong, but the weak. God comes, that is, for us. Jesus brings good news to you. But Jesus does not bring good news to you alone. Some of us know the chains of not forgiving another person. We know the darkness and blindness of not seeing others and the world as Jesus sees the world. There is a weight and a prison of sin that can feel like a trap around us. We know the prison of grief. In the song, Amazing Grace, we sing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Jesus proclaims good news for you who know that you are or have been lost. Jesus brings healing to you who know the heartache of brokenness. Jesus brings good news to you who know the darkness of being blinded by sin. Jesus comes to you offering forgiveness. And together, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can be transformed by the good news that Jesus brings and be a part of Jesus' mission of love and healing for those who suffer and who are lost. Jesus heals the broken. Our text for today leaves us with eyes fixed on Jesus. In baptism, we are claimed and the power of the Holy Spirit fills us. We can be those who fix our eyes on Jesus and follow him. With our eyes on Jesus, we give our lives in love for others, laboring for freedom, for hope, and love. Following my internship, I had the opportunity to spend a few uh, weeks with a friends of mine who lived in community together. There was about seven of them that lived in a house together, and they did a lot of ministry together through their church and just in their work and in their community. And one of the women that they had welcomed into their home had, had been one of those slaves we talked about. She had been in prostitution, and she had been welcomed into their home and um, was now off in her own apartment. But Meredith was someone that they had been reaching out to for uh, many years, actually. I think it was already at least two years when I came to stay with them, she was homeless and living on the street. She lived pretty much in her little camping chair that had a little canopy over top with her boxes nearby. And they befriended her, they uh, bring a meal to her and just come and visit. And over time, she began to trust them. She was one who was enslaved somewhat by fear, by fear even of going to a shelter for things that her things would be stolen away from her. Um, she'd had a very difficult life, but she had a strong faith as well in Jesus Christ. And when during those weeks that I happened to be there with them, they were trying to invite her into their home. They'd been trying to do this for a while, but now the trust was built. And so during that time that I stayed with them, Meredith began living in their home too, as a part of their community. And it took some time. Even, you know, she was going to move in one day, and then it, she just didn't have... Uh, the courage to do it, but she eventually did. And when she laid in a bed, she was in so much pain because she had not laid flat on a bed in years. I think it's like 
seven years. She'd always been sleeping, sitting up in this camping chair. But they welcomed her into their home. And it turns out she ended up, they got her to a chance to go to a doctor. And it turns out she had cancer. And she actually only lived about four more months with them. But during that time, they were able to help her reconcile with her, her son, who she hadn't been in contact with for many, many years. In fact, it involved flying to California to find him and uh, reconcile them together. But they were able to do that as a community, to reach out to her who was lost and who was poor and who was captive by many things, but they welcomed her into their community. And they could do that because they did it together. And they did it as a community of brothers and sisters together. Loving her together, reaching out together. They offered community together. There's a sacrifice in loving and serving others, but there is a deep, deep joy that comes from that as well. We follow the set one Jesus in mission. We get to not only hear the good news that Jesus brings today, but we get to be a part of that good news. The church is called to continue Jesus' earthly mission of bringing good news to the poor, proclaiming freedom for captives, preaching the kingdom of God, calling people to repentance, working for healing, and fighting oppression. We are to be a community with and for the world. As followers of Jesus, we are God's hands and feet in the here and now. In the spirit of Christ, we give our best for the world. And the author of the Evangelizing Church writes, Christ wants life for us. And so Christ comes down here with no merit of our own, calls us to follow him. He calls us out of the hollow emptiness of our sleepy lives and sets us free for a life that means something, a life of witness and service and self-giving love, a life that gives itself away for the sake of the world. Christ has given us a most wonderful gift. So what? So that we can really live. The gift Christ gives is not a blanket of forgiveness that we can just wrap around ourselves to keep warm and dry. The gift Christ gives is a wake-up call. It is a call to a new life that comes from the evangelizing of the church. Michael Frost and Alan Hirsch write that mission is not merely an activity of the church, but is the very heartbeat and work of God. It is in the very being of who God is. God is ascending God with a desire to see humankind and creation reconciled, redeemed, and healed. The missional church, then, is a sent church. Resurrection is a sent church. You team together in so many ways to serve in the community and throughout the world. Our Helping Hands quilting group that meets on Mondays provides the comfort and reminder of God's presence with those in need, when they face loss here locally or overseas, for those in great poverty. And, and now, just in this next week, we're going to be working together for Kids Against Hunger. This upcoming Wednesday and next Sunday, we're teaming together with Kids Against Hunger Iowa to package much-needed life-saving meals for the poor and hungry. It's a time to join together as brothers and sisters, to reach out alongside others, and to follow Jesus in bringing good news to the poor. Kids Against Hunger Iowa provides food globally to Haiti, East Africa, Liberia, Nicaragua, and other countries, and also provides food locally as well to crisis centers here in Iowa. We're going to see a little video clip to see a taste of what that was like maybe eight years ago, um, and, uh, and what you, hopefully a lot of you will be able to be a part of this in this upcoming week.
But we're gonna kiss. So teaming together, all having a part of being working together, and this is something we're gonna be doing right here at, at uh, Resurrection. There's more that we can do together as brothers and sisters. As a congregation, you bring good news. You are generous in your time and in your giving for those who are poor and hungry, and there is much more that we can still do. You are listening in the spirit and following Jesus in mission. You bring good news in workplaces, teaching the vulnerable in schools and preschools and with your own families, laboring to bring health and safety to our neighborhoods or modes of transportation through Rockwell and the railroad and law enforcement and sanitation. You are lifting burdens through your volunteering. You are bringing healing through your work and care facilities and clinics and hospitals. Sometimes I have wondered, and maybe you have wondered too, what do I have to offer? When I visit someone who is sick or injured or go to see a friend who is having a hard time, and then often the Holy Spirit reminds me that Christ is with me. I bring Christ in me. Jesus is there with us. Jesus is there with you, active and working. The power and call of the Holy Spirit are with you. Burkhart writes, it is the Holy Spirit speaking when you hear God whisper to you, child of God, live this day as if it were your first day, as if it were your last day, as if it were your only day. With my friends in the community house that reached out to Meredith, they were able to love her in ways they could not do if they lived on their own. We can do more as a family together, as a church together, as brothers and sisters in Christ together. And what about right here? There are so many resources, gifts, talents, passions, skills. If we team together, it's almost hard to imagine what might be possible. You think of the capacity we have to love together, compounded together, or even within your own small group, or within your family. The gifts and time and love that you have joined together and how you might listen together for how the Spirit of the Lord might be calling you and what, what, what might be calling you to be open to. So for our question for the day for today, I want you to turn to someone or maybe you slide or move next to someone and think about what is one dream or hope that you have for the church this year and one way that you can help make that dream a reality. If you're a visitor for today, maybe it's a... a a dream you have for your own church or for yourself for this year. But to think, what's one dream or hope that you have for the church this year and one way that you can help make that dream a reality? I invite you to share with one another. <coughs> share that. I invite you to do that. Um, no pressure. You don't have to do that either. But still getting to know you all. So be interested to see what some of the dreams and hopes are for this church. We get to be uh, swept up in the current of God's work of healing and releasing and forgiving. We are the body of Christ, claimed in baptism, empowered by the Holy Spirit to follow Jesus Christ in mission. Jesus ended up being rejected in his hometown for the message that he brought. And as we follow Jesus, we too may face rejection and suffering. But together, we can continue Jesus' mission of love, freedom, healing, and and remember that we do not go alone. May the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of Jesus strengthen you to continue this world-changing mission. One conversation, one meal, one day, one life 